reading 17 now aggregate output prices and economic growth now again this is a huge monster reading and we've tried to compress the most important points first important point is gdp gross domestic product gross domestic gross domestic product refers to the market value of all final goods and services produced with Gross domestic product refers to the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country over a specific time period, usually one year. Government transfers and goods and services without market value are not included. So if you, if you are doing your own gardening, that does not count as part of GDP. If a government is making transfer payments to its citizens that also is not included in GDP. There are several alternatives to calculating GDP. One is to use the income approach which computes GDP as the total income earned by households, businesses and the government in the country during a time period. The relationship here is that the total output of an economy is equal to the total income as defined over here. You can also calculate GDP using the expenditure approach can be computed through the sum of value added approach where GDP is calculated by summing the value addition at each stage of production and distribution and the example in the curriculum is that of the milk retail supply chain where you look at the value added at each stage and sum up the value add or in one of the curriculum examples that we did which is part of this crash course package we look at the auto industry and add the value added gdp can also be computed using the value of final output where gdp is calculated by where gdp is calculated by summing the values of all final goods and services produced during the period the expenditures approach can be stated as follows. So the GDP is equal to the consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, X minus M. Very important relationship. You must remember this. Nominal versus real GDP. Nominal GDP values goods and services at their current prices. Real GDP measures current year output using prices from a base year. So if in a given country the base year is 2000, then the real GDP will be based on 2000 prices, not current year prices. By doing so, what GDP does is eliminates the effect of inflation. The GDP deflator is a price index that can be used to convert nominal GDP into real GDP by removing the effects of changes in prices. The GDP deflator is the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP into 100 and you can do some algebraic manipulation to say that real GDP is equal to nominal GDP divided by the deflator into 100. Other measures of aggregate output and this is tough because it's not all of it is not logical you just need to remember this. Remember income is also a measure of output. National income is identified as the income received by all factors of production used in the creation of final output. So national income is equal to the employee wages and benefits, the corporate pre-tax profit, so this is like the income of the corporate sector, plus any interest income, plus rent, plus, in or plus, in plus unincorporated business owner's income, so this is the small private businesses, their profits, plus any indirect business taxes, minus subsidies. Personal income is the pre-tax income received by households and this is equal to the national income plus transfer payments to households. These are the payments that the governments make to households, minus any indirect business taxes, minus any corporate taxes and minus any undistributed corporate profits. These are the retained earnings. And then personal disposable income is the personal income minus personal taxes. This is the easiest one to remember. 
Each periods each period individuals decide whether to save or consume disposable income. Just as a note to remember, a transfer payment is a redistribution of income by the government which does not entail the exchange of any good or service. Examples are welfare and social security. All right, now coming to everybody's favorite topic, the IS curve, the LM curve, and the aggregate demand curve. Here, my piece of advice is that if you haven't already understood these items, then it's not worth spending too much time because it is just one learning objective out of hundreds. And the probability of being tested on this is comparable to any other learning objective. So the effort is high and the potential return is low. But having said that, let us just understand the basics associated with each of these. And then as long as you do the questions at the back of your reading and from past papers and so on, then that should be good enough. So what is the basic definition of the IS curve and what does IS mean? The curriculum doesn't really spend much time on that, but just to help you remember, IS means income equals saving. So the IS curve states that this condition holds, this condition being savings minus investment must be equal to G minus T, which is the government deficit plus X minus M, which is the net exports. This condition holds when income is equal to planned expenditure. The IS curve shows a negative relationship between real interest rates and income. So we plot real interest rates on the Y axis, income on the X axis and the IS curve shows that we have a negative relationship. Some points that are used in the derivation and I'm just going to give you the points not do the derivation in this crash course. The points are as follows. Investment spending, which is generally denoted by I, is based on interest rates and aggregate income. Obviously, if interest rates are low, then investment spending is high. And if aggregate income is high, then investment spending is high. Government spending is determined outside the model, but taxes depend on income. Net exports depend on income differential and price differential between domestic economy and rest of the world. So just try to remember these points and remember the fact that these points are used in the derivation of the IS curve. The LM curve, the LM curve, the M here stands for money. The LM curve shows the positive relationship between real interest rates and the level of aggregate income and the condition that must hold true is that the money market is in equilibrium, which means that the demand and supply of real money balances are equal or balanced. And this particular curve actually looks like this. So in red over here, we show the LM curve. It shows a positive relationship between real interest rate and income given that the money supply is equal to money demand or actually the real money supply and real money demand are equal. Among the points that are used to derive the curve, you need to know these. The quantity theory of money which keeps coming up, so MV, the money supply into V which is velocity is equal to price level into Y which is the output. The demand for money is inversely related to interest rates. This is another important point. If interest rates are high, you are getting high return on bonds and so on, then your demand for money will be low. Demand for real money is an increasing function of real income and a decreasing function of interest rates. If the price level increases, then your real money, I'm sorry, if the price level decreases, then your real money will increase because your buying power goes up and that causes the LM curve to shift right. And this is the basis for the derivation of the aggregate demand curve. So if you have a certain price level and then you are at this level of income, let's say Y1, then the price level decreases what is going to happen to the equilibrium point where LM curve and IS curve intersect? 
then notice this point you will have a higher level of income so as the price level decreases the GDP or the income goes up and that essentially is our aggregate demand curve which has a negative relationship between the price level and the income income being the same as output and generally being denoted by the symbol Y the aggregate demand curve shows the negative relationship between GDP which is the real output demanded and the price level as we saw in microeconomics here also we need to be aware of movements along the curve and shifts in the curve as long as the price level increases the output decreases and we have to say that the assumptions behind the IS and the LM curves hold so those variables stay constant then we have a movement along the curve what is it that causes the aggregate demand curve to shift shifts in aggregate demand are caused by changes in household wealth business and consumer expectations capacity utilization fiscal policy monetary policy currency exchange rates and global economic growth rates and you can use your common sense to determine how a particular change is going to impact the aggregate demand just to give you a simple example if household wealth goes up then aggregate demand will shift to the right and as I keep saying in economics if all else fails then use common sense all right aggregate supply the aggregate supply curve shows the positive relationship between GDP and the price level and we actually have three supply curves one in the very short run then short run and long run the very short run is shown as this horizontal line input quantities are fixed and aggregate supply does not change then in the short run as prices are fixed so businesses expand real output when prices increase so this is the upward sloping curve over here a business looks at prices going up and produces more in the short run in the long run if prices go up then the costs such as wages also adjust so in real terms we are back to square one the aggregate supply is perfectly inelastic or vertical and this represents the potential GDP which is the full employment level of economic output so in the long run you can't just change output by changes by changing price levels you need to know what causes shifts in short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply shifts in short run aggregate supply are caused by changes in input prices expectations about the future changes in business tax rates changes in subsidies or changes in exchange rates shifts in the long run aggregate supply are caused by changes in labor supply so if you have more people working then long run will shift availability of natural resources if suddenly you find new reserves of oil and gas then your output will go up stock of physical capital if physical capital increases your productivity increases and the potential GDP increases changes in productivity and technology if your country becomes more productive through better technology then that will also impact your long run aggregate supply a few key terms recessionary gap this refers to a situation where real GDP as determined by the intersection of aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply is less than potential GDP and you need to be quick at drawing this so if this is your aggregate demand curve this is your short run aggregate supply the intersection refers to the real GDP so if this real GDP point is less than potential GDP so your potential GDP is here at point Y2 and your real GDP currently is at Y1 then this gap is called a recessionary gap your current output is less than what it potentially can be an inflationary gap is the other scenario this is where the real 
GDP is more than the potential GDP. Now, actually, quickly going back to the recessionary gap, a recessionary gap results in downward pressure on input prices, which causes an increase in the short run aggregate supply back to the long run equilibrium. So, the simplistic point here is that if you have a recessionary gap, then people might be willing to work for less. The cost goes down, so the aggregate supply curve, the short run aggregate supply curve will shift to the right and at least in theory we will get back out of the recession. An inflationary gap results in an upward pressure on input prices which causes a decrease in the short run aggregate supply back towards long run equilibrium. This other term that you should know is stagflation. This refers to simultaneous high inflation and weak economic growth which results from a sudden decrease in short run aggregate supply. What are the various sources of economic growth? The two major sources of economic growth are increases in factors of production. So either more labor, human capital in the sense that smarter people, increases in physical capital, increases in natural resources or advances in technology which essentially means greater productivity. Potential GDP is equal to the aggregate hours worked into labor productivity. So potential GDP is a measure of the total output of an economy and obviously that depends on how much people are working and how productively people are working. The growth in potential GDP, which is what most economists are after, and obviously you as an investor will look for economies where there is high growth in potential GDP. That growth comes from growth in technology, so greater productivity. It comes from growth in labor and growth in capital. So more people working or people working with better equipment. All these items lead to growth in potential GDP. The W's that you see over here are the relative share of labor and capital in the national income. This is material we see in more detail at level 2. Often economists are also concerned with growth in per capita potential GDP because this is a measure of the actual wealth of a nation. What is the output or the income on a per capita basis? So the growth in per capita potential GDP is based on growth in technology. So how much more productive is that nation? And then the growth in the capital to labor ratio. So how much equipment capital do we have per unit of labor? The production function in this context is as follows. Your output of a given nation depends on A, which is the technology. And then the output is a function of labor, how many people working and capital. This is a simplistic model. Obviously, you can have other factors of production, but mostly economists model output in terms of labor and capital.